This is the Name More NBA podcast brought to you by Prize Picks. Coming up Monday morning, it's April 8th, and we've got two games to talk about on today's show. Obviously, the Wolves win in LA on Sunday night. Uh, we'll get into that one, Nas, Reed, etc. cetera. Uh, and then also we have the loss in Phoenix on Friday night to, to talk about. The, the Wolves and Suns hadn't played each other since November 15th, uh, so we knew there was going to be yeah a, a lot to learn um, as those two teams matched up on Friday, and I think we did learn some things. Uh, so that'll be more the the second half of this episode again. What we learned about the Phoenix matchup, Chris Hine, uh, who normally does uh, Monday mornings, is flying out of LA this morning because he was at the game uh, last night. So we moved some things around. Uh, Chris will be on the show Tuesday morning, um, and we've got uh, Kyle here on Kyle Tige here on Monday morning to to recap. The weekend, what's up, Kyle? What's up? Did I was just thinking this morning, it's been kind of a, a wild week. It's just crazy that we did that interview like a little over a week ago. <laughs> and just to think of everything that's taken place, the ups, the downs. I know we're gonna get into it all. I thought that was a week since no three game losing streaks. Right. Yeah, yeah. Bad yeah. things happen out of the mind, right? I know, but it was just it was, it was, was there's a lot of got it all. cool stuff to talk about because they had a couple of nice wins. They had a really, really bad loss in terms of just kind of getting punked. And then last night, you know, injuries aside on the Lakers side, they uh they were able to kind of rebound. So just I don't know. It's I was joking with you. I still haven't really digested everything that we did a couple, you know, 10 days ago, but uh, it's been nice to quickly pivot back into basketball. And I think that's we got a good hour here of basketball talk coming up on today's show. Yeah, man. Um, I am excited about yeah, to get into I mean Nas last night. I think that's where we'll start, but uh First, I wanted to uh, let people know kind of right here at the top of the episode, we want to get this on people's uh, radars that me, Kyle, and Britt will be at Falling Knife Brewing Company for a live show on April 19th. Do like a six o'clock happy hour, seven o'clock live show. April 19th is going to be the day before the Wolves first game of the playoffs or two days before the first it's a Friday. Yeah, it's a, it's a Friday, April 19th and the Wolves game one is going to be April 20th or April 21st. So, Kyle, we kind of lined this up back a couple months ago as we started piecing together uh, the schedule and we thought and working uh, with Dan and the Falling Knife guys that this would be, yeah, this would be perfect. Kind of a way to to kick off uh, the, the Wolves being in the playoffs. Obviously, Falling Knife is a place for people to be going for all of those playoff games. They're going to have extended seating, outdoor seating uh, with TVs or the TV truck out there for the playoffs. Um, but... Yeah, we wanted to. We can't be there on game nights because we are at the games. Uh, but we wanted to to get to Falling Knife, knife get everyone gathered together, and uh, yeah, do do a live show on the nineteenth. We'll we'll hang out. I think there'll be a play in game going on on the TVs that night as well. But put that down in your calendars, April nineteenth. I would say get there at six. Um, particularly if you want to uh, get a spot, we'll be walking around, hanging out, setting up um, at six, and we'll do the live show at seven. So that's Falling Knife Brewing Company. And that's in Northeast Minneapolis. Uh, all right, Kyle, let's uh, let's start uh, with last night. The Wolves-Lakers um, that obviously we find out in the, the afternoon, no LeBron James uh, in, in that game, flu-like symptoms. And then Anthony Davis uh, gets hurt in, in the, the first quarter. And the, the Wolves just kind of rolled from that point on. Uh, Nas Reed was kind of going, I guess, from, from the beginning of that game, though. He had 23 points in the first half. He finished with 31 and 11 on six of eight shooting from three. A real bounce back game uh, from Phoenix on Friday as well. I think we can kind of talk about the inverse of Nas, a bad Nas game <clears throat> uh, when we, once we talk about that Suns game. But honestly, to have that big of a game after his worst game of the season, I thought was uh, in in. Completely impressive, and we can talk about some six man of the year stuff there, which he's really making a case for. But what what stood out to you uh, about Nas last night? I mean, it was the Megan the Stallion day game for Nas. Uh, it was cool to see him bounce back and play like that. Also, I had to watch, you know, this, but I had to watch the game on NBA TV because of league pass blackout rules or whatever. So I'm getting a different call than obviously our guys, Jim and Grady, but uh. It's fun to always see. I mean, I think it was good people calling the game on NBA TV, but it's always fun to hear people that how many games have they watched Nas Reed play, right? So Nas looked so bad on Friday. Maybe his worst game of the season in this role. I don't think that's an argument. 
but then to quickly pivot and just play as good as he did shoot the ball. I mean, his, that very first three, I remember like the above yeah. the break on the right side. And it was just like, caught it immediately up. No hesitation, no nothing. I mean, I was like, okay, it's not, it's not sticking. Sorry to cut you off, but that, that, no, that was, it, it was just, that was the coolest thing for me thinking back every time I watch him and he plays well, this is just how my dumb brain works, but I'm just constantly reminded. And they said this on the call on NBA TV that, you know, Nas Reed undrafted out of LSU. It's just an incredible story, right? Like for him to develop and grow this much. I was watching some Nas Reed uh, high school highlights last week. Again, what were you doing last week? Not a lot of good stuff, uh, but that was, he's just so important to this team. And I think his energy, we always talk about Ant and just his in energy and kind of personality being infectious. Nas Reed, I think was mic'd up last night. So they would do a lot of like little Nas Reed segments and there was just one where he was standing on the sideline yelling at Kyle Anderson, slow-mo, you're not tired. And it was like the most innocent juvenile thing, but he's just like yelling at slow-mo. He's like, you're not tired. You're not tired. Uh, his He's just such a core part of this team now, right? Like it was less than 12 months ago where we were sitting in this spot looking at a playoff series. Nas has just broken his wrist and you're like, I mean, I think I said this to you. Was that the last game we'll ever see of Nas Reed in a Timberwolves jersey? Oh. You know what I mean? Breaking his wrist in Phoenix and then to come full circle a year later. And yeah, he didn't play well against Phoenix, but he was their best player last night. And just the way he moves the ball, the way he gets the, the ball up, it's not a lot of thinking. It's a lot of just action. And I think that just is infectious for a team that's still, and we saw it again last night, can have moments where they get really sticky with it. And Nas is just, you know, the antithesis of, of sticky basketball. Right. Um. Not not to brush over it, but to keep it moving. We've got two games to to talk about. I just want to hit on the uh his sixth man of the year candidacy again when I mean, I don't know, three weeks ago, it was like, oh cute, like the odds are moving, you know, from like 10 to 1 to 5 to 1 that that Nas uh could get it. Obviously, Malik Monk has kind of gotten hurt as as Nas has gotten hot. I think we all again at that time seemed like Monk kind of had it in the bag. You know, uh, none of this is to take away from Monk's season. I think, you know, I mean, the, the Kings and and the Clippers are, are two teams that we've watched a lot of. I think Malik Monk and Norman Powell have had really good years um, in, in that role for, for their teams. But I think Nas has had a better year. I, I, I do. And, like I guess this is obvious, but John uh, Krasinski tweeted out something about oh yeah about his defense mm-hmm. and in the six man of the year conversation. It's like obviously we've talked about Nas's defense and how meaningful and important that has been to be playing a new position to not be a weak link like he hasn't been um, this season. But I I guess I don't know. You just don't normally think about defense in the context of six man of the year, right? And you don't normally think about defense in the context of Nas Reed, right? That's not like the first thing that 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 comes up. But the the defensive year he's had, and just like statistically, it you know it, it does really bear out. Like if you if you look at some of the catch all me- metrics um, and defensive estimated plus minus, Nas Reed is seventy fourth percentile uh, in the league, where Malik Monk is twenty first percentile. There, uh, Monk is a probably more impactful offensive player, which is a credit to Monk, not a discredit to, to Nas. You look at, again, those those numbers, Monk is 82nd percentile this year offensively, Nas uh, 65th. Overall, it just says, you put that together, Nas 71st percentile, Monk 62nd percentile. The numbers suggest that he's, he's having a better season. Uh, again, having watched a lot of the Kings, I think some of that undersells Malik Monk, but... I would also argue that 65th percentile offensively for Nas Reed kind of undersells what he's done um, and, and meant to this team offensively, particularly over this, this last month stretch. I didn't think we would get to the point or that I would get to the point where I was like, yeah, this is close or even Nas being favored. And it's a little bit of a prisoner of the moment, but it's been like a prisoner of the month. Uh, with him, that that Phoenix game notwithstanding, I, I I don't know if you were going to make a push for six man of the year. What Nas has done over this last uh, month since Cat's been out, partially in a starter role, partially in a bench role, even in that in that time, um, has just been huge for keeping this team where it is, which is at the top of the standings, which makes the case 
for all these guys, right? Um, you can argue Ant on a higher all NBA team because the Wolves have the best record in the West. You can um, make an all NBA case, I think, for Rudy based on where they are in the standings. And I think for Nas too, uh, that's a that's an important factor in the Wolves are just having a significantly better season than than the Kings are. And even if their impacts on their teams are similar, um, I, I don't know. I, I think we need to be be considering where the Wolves are and how important uh, Nas has been in putting that team there. So yeah, I'm at the point where he's up there. It's at least like a, a coin toss to me, if not, you know, leaning towards Nas deserving that award. Yeah, I know you don't want me to turn this <clears throat> into a entire NBA award segment, but I just in general, this is the first time for in seven years that we've covered the team, you and I, that the Wolves have been good, like really good. And but I, this is the 35th year of me watching the league and following the league. And winning always matters. It matters for all these awards. Like it just does. And the Wolves never win, so I'm not really used to this. But whether it be like coach of the year stuff or the six man thing, I think if you if this was any other team, right? I always joke about like the blind resume. If this was just any other team, I think all these guys would just be shoo-ins. Like there's still people that are trying to make cases that like Rudy shouldn't win six man or a defensive player of the year. And it's like, dude, that is that should be over. I kind of feel the same way with this six man of the year stuff. Is Monk was, you know, having a year and then kind of lost to do an injury, but the defensive side of the ball for Nas and then just what he's done. I mean, I think he's been their leading scorer in like half of their last eight games. Uh, his ability yeah. to just kind of transition from that bench role. I mean, obviously he's starting now, but what he's done all season, being available, coming in high energy, the only reason he wouldn't get it, or like people are like, wait, how would he get it? If you go back to Corliss Williamson in 2001, 2002. Shout out Corliss Williamson, Wolves assistant let me, let me, I'm just going to run it back year by year, but here's all the guys that have won six man of the year. Malcolm Brogdon, Tyler Hero, Jordan Clarkson, Montrez Harrell, in 1920, Lou Williams, Lou Williams, 19. Eric Gordon, Jamal oh. Crawford, Lou Williams, Jamal Crawford, J.R. Smith, James Harden, Lamar Odom, Jamal Crawford, Jason Terry, Manu Ginobili, Leandro Barbosa, Mike Miller, shout out, Ben Gordon, Antoine Jameson, Bobby Jackson, and Carlos Williamson. My point is, I think there's two big guys in there in the last 22 years. So it also has kind of become a guard award. Sure. And that's another reason why. I think the odds are still, I checked this morning, they're like him and Malik Monk are basically even. Hmm. I think Nas Reed by the end of this is just going to win. And I know some people were kind of, I think Chris, our friend Chris Hine was having some fun with the last night, but like Bill Simmons was sitting courtside. The next time he does a basketball pod about the Timberwolves, he's probably going to be like, do you guys know about Nas Reed? And try to probably claim that he was the guy that discovered him. But uh, I think Nas will win six men of the year. And then also last night it was cool. Chris was asking him, I think he really wants it. Yeah. I think it really really matters to him and that circles all the way back to being undrafted like what a cool story for a guy to not be one of the first 60 picks in a draft and then to come full circle and be like hey i'm i'm the sixth man of the year and i'm you know maybe a starting power forward for a, a franchise moving forward so credit to him and all his hard work but i'm biased but that guy should win it because like you said earlier and john said he does it on both sides of the ball yeah no i think that's a that's a real fair qualifier here and to again to at least push him up to the the same point i guess there's like the does he deserve it or will he get it and i always yeah that's it yeah that's different <laughs> they, well but but also like i think a lot of people and of the hundred voters or whatever in theory are pretty dialed on the wolves right now too you know i think he's getting seen a lot over over the the last month i mean the wolves are one of the best teams in the league um, at a critical time of the season, I think he's going to get some eyeballs. So I, I, I actually, it wouldn't surprise me uh, at all. I almost kind of think uh, he he will get it there. Uh, let's keep uh, let's keep moving um, with uh, through through the Lakers game a little bit. Do you want to pick a another thing from that game? I weirdly have Jaden McDaniel's down as my <laughs> second thing on on here. Um, you know, not to take. I mean, I think Ant passed the ball well and all that, but. Maybe this is kind of a over the the whole weekend thing. I just thought it was maybe a little low key, like the didn't did pop as much as what Nas did. But I thought what what Jaden was able to do over over the course of the weekend, guarding you know Devin Booker, 
Uh, and then last night taking the D'Angelo Russell matchup after a bit. I think that's just, it's huge. You know, being able to prevent Booker or Russell, who both can and have done many, many times this season, be game breakers. Uh, Jaden really prevented that. And, um, you know, we've, we've come to expect that from McDaniels. Doesn't mean it shouldn't be acknowledged, but just being able to slow D'Lo and Austin Reeves last night in in those matchups, I, I thought was huge. And then also right away from the beginning, oftentimes in those matchups, when he is guarding like a, a D'Lo type player, it's oftentimes D'Lo, that, that offensive player who's not a great defender is going to guard Jaden. And uh, he had that on his mind right away from the beginning. I saw the aggressiveness offensively. Like, you cannot put a small player on me. I will put them in the basket. And and he often did. I mean, it was only 11 points last night. Didn't make any threes. But five for seven from two, just like, I really thought that that was kind of the a really, really good Jaden McDaniels game. And do, doesn't maybe pop as much uh, in, in the box score as, you know, what, Ant's numbers, even Rudy had really good numbers last night. I thought it was kind of a funky uh, Rudy game. I just thought Jaden was was really important in that game. I think legally, I just have to remind everyone that Jaden McDaniels did sign a contract extension and is going to get paid more money next year, uh, just so people don't yell at me. Do you know the last time he fouled out? No. January 10th in the overtime loss to the Celtics. Well, not, not that fouling is in overtime, all, but yeah. yeah, in overtime. Uh, but he's fouled out once in 2024. So again, just I know that that's not really what the angle you were going at. You were talking more Let's actual, go rule change, <laughs> high level Big. defense, and I'm just petty looking at a stat. Uh, but it's I think that's also important too. That's for a that was a knock on him, right? Is that you get in foul trouble too much? I mean, if you even go really dive into it, he's not even like I think he's only had five fouls like three times since January 10th. So his ability to defend, yeah, they got spanked by the Suns, uh, but he still was giving Devin Booker just fits. Right. And then last night again for for D'Lo, uh, who did have 11 assists and played a solid game, especially you no know, LeBron and AD, he kind of had to be looking for a shot more. But what oh, was he five for 21? Yeah, he was guarded primarily by Jaden. And then there was a couple times too. I mean, Jaden only had 11 points last night. That's for now, I guess, kind of a good offensive production game for him. But there was a couple of times, too, where even like against Austin Reeves, you can tell Jaden, I don't think, likes Austin Reeves. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't think Jaden likes many people. Or but it I doesn't look like what he's playing, but I, I noticed but that, too. He, uh, I think Austin Reeves kind of got him with some grifting foul on one end. And then the next play down, Jaden got the ball. And just how, how often do you see Jaden get the ball? And is like, bleep the offense. I'm going to do my own thing. And he went directly at Austin Reeves, couple shoulders in, kind of hits one of those, as Britt calls him, reclining yeah. share fadeaways and gets an and one and that was like a nice little momentum builder in in the moment so if it come playoff time that's all you really need from Jaden on that side of the ball is to keep him honest because yeah. in that one play to you know to get the ball on the wing get to their basket get an and one that kind of reverberates throughout the opponent's coaching staff of like oh shit like mm -hmm. okay we can't we can't treat him like Andre Roberson he right. has some offensive games so but yeah, his defense has been incredible and he's kind of back to that shutdown corner mode where you can just throw him on a guy and not really worry about it. And just be like, okay, the other four guys will play team defense in a sense, but Jaden's just going to have to watching a six foot 10 guy. That's built like Gumby navigate screens is one of like my five favorite things about this team. Just cause it's, he's always, there's so many times where like he's not in a defensive stance. He's like perpendicular to his opponent and he's just trying to move around and he just gives him fits. Like that's the best way to describe it. And I thought the last 72 hours were kind of that peak Jaden defense again. Yeah, my favorite is when he does that, but he's also like that kind of slithering around, staying connected to the guy, particularly if it's a small player. And then he kind of does like the umbrella contest. Locked. Yeah, yeah. You know, where it's just <laughs> yeah. like, no, I'm just going to have my hand here above your head, try and shoot it. Indeed, they can. It's like, but you're probably not uh, able to to shoot that normally. Yeah, I thought, I thought Jaden stood out in a, in a major way last night. Let's grab our first break here. I keep talking about the Lakers uh, in, in a minute. Uh, today's show is brought to you by Your Home Improvement Company. Uh, we always say, you know, if, if for any of these things, if you have uh, a need, um, and, and in this case, home a home renovation project, uh, keep it in the, the Wolves family uh, with, with Your Home Improvement Company. 
Uh, they have a deal right now that's buy two, get two windows uh, for free. Uh, maybe it's the spring right now. You're ready to be like, okay, maybe we didn't need any windows in the uh, in the in the winter time, but it's uh, it's time to get that taken care of. Uh, you can contact YHIC at YHIC.com or call them at 866-777-YHIC. Um, also, a bathroom renovation project. It can be a whole like a whole bathroom renovation or a simple uh, shower bathtub conversion, and they can get that and done. Get that done in as little. As, as one day their bathroom renovations for April are 30% off as well. Uh, your home improvement company is zero down, zero interest, zero payments um, until 2025. And again, that number is 866-777-YHIC, or you can go to yourhomeimprovementco.com, yhic.com. Your home improvement company, where it's your home made better. Also, just quickly, uh, Kyle, today's show is also... Uh, brought to you by Prize Picks. Uh, we have the national championship game tonight. I'm uh, just kind of looking at some of these here. Before you got, you know, Zach Eady more or less than uh, 12 and a half rebounds, more or less than 24 and a half points. And, you know, you've, if you've been watching the tournament, you kind of have a, a feel for Purdue uh, and and UConn, and can kind of you know put those together, put together uh, a little slate uh, for that game. Uh, always just a fun way to play some some daily fantasy. You can just put five bucks or whatever uh, on a game. That's prizepicks.com or the Prize Picks app. And you can use promo code Dane for a $100 sign up bonus. Shout out to Tim Conley. He believed that size matters and uh, he went big when everyone else was kind of playing small. And now you have a national championship game with just two, what, <laughs> seven foot four dudes. Just tonight's game is going to be, I mean, my bracket was toast the morning the tournament started, but. To get ED versus Klingon tonight is going to be really yeah. high level basketball, and it's the only game on tonight, right? So yeah, no NBA. Digest this pod and then tune in for Purdue UConn, but uh, that's going to be a good one. So good job, Tim. <laughs> um, let's talk about Ant a little bit uh, from from last night, specific to to the the Lakers game. Uh, the the shooting has still been, you know, come and go or not super efficient for him over over the last few weeks. What I think we got back to last night against the Lakers was some of his playmaking. Uh, was it eight assists that he finished with? In one that turnover. Game? Yeah, eight assists, one turnover uh, in in that game. Uh, I thought that was um, you know meaningful. Obviously, that's always meaningful for this team, particularly the turnovers element. Can Ant be a scorer and a ball mover simultaneously? If he's doing that, Nasri is playing the way he is or did last night you kind of have the confidence that the offense is going to give you enough to let your defense win the game for you. Obviously that's not what happened um, on Friday against the Suns. He didn't get that from Ant. He didn't get that from Nas and the defense was solid, but not enough to, to help you win. Ant has to be, um, Ant has to be good on offense for this mm -hmm. team to, to win right now against, against good teams. You know, you can, there were some bad, some bad Ant games that they won still, um, again, over the, the last few weeks, not against maybe Suns or Lakers levels uh, of, of opponent. But uh, yeah, I think this is his moment. He knows they need him to kind of drive the bus here, at least until uh, Carl gets back, which is apparently coming here uh, pretty soon. But just, uh, yeah, what stood out to you about Ant's offense, specific to the Lakers game? We can get into Phoenix uh, a little bit later. Well, I have a different takeaway, but it does tie sure. into Ant because you and I were texting throughout the game last night. Last night's game, Lakers-Wolves, can pretty much be summed up by Anthony Davis because in the second quarter, the Wolves outscored the Lakers 46-27, to and that's when AD had gone out, right? Like, he yeah. checked out, I think, at the end of the first, never came back to the bench, had gotten hit in the face, and the Wolves smelled blood, and they said, okay, there's no AD. We're going to, you know, we're going to cook. And I think simultaneously, the Lakers were like, there's no AD. We're going to get cooked. And then Ant said this post game, but – coming out of the break or the coming out of the halftime break, I think, again, both teams were kind of like no AD, but the Wolves then just let off the pedal as hard as they could. And the Lakers, you know, had a, made a run there. It was a 20-point game, and all of a sudden it's five. Uh, and that's like a concerning thing. It is it is a characteristic of this team is that they do just constantly play with your, their food. A lot of teams do. You don't see teams take a 20-point lead and then make it 40. I feel like oftentimes it does get back to single digits. But uh, there was a quote. I think Chris Hine had this post game where they said, what, what did you see in the third or what happened? Ant and Ant's like, 
I quit passing or I, I decided to start shooting or I gave up passing the ball. I didn't love that. If I can just like have one little criticism, because those eight assists to one turnover, I mean, the offense looked so good in the second quarter and that was including the bench guys and stuff too. But uh, yeah, I just think when Anthony Davis went out, both teams kind of like looked right. at it different ways. And then when they realized Anthony Davis was out, both teams kind of flipped. Uh, but all in all, whether AD played or not, I just think to your larger point, this team is going to go as far in the playoffs when this does bog down. And this is probably a good way to somewhat pivot into that Suns game. A lot of the offensive responsibility, Carl, no Carl, you know, Mike's been a little weird, by the way, with turnovers lately. I think Mike Conley has more turnovers in April than he had in October through March. Uh, it's a lot of it's going to go through Ant, and it's not just scoring, right? To that third quarter quote joke he made. It's a lot of it is his playmaking too, because they're going to constantly throw doubles at him. They're going to constantly, as Brad Beal said over the weekend, foul the shit out of him. And he's going to have to find ways to get his other guys involved because if he can trust his teammates, which, he, which he's done all season, it's going to make this team a lot harder. And then Mike and Slomo and Finchie are always telling Ant this, making the easy read is just going to make Ant's life easier long-term in a game. Right. So just trusting that, hey, man, just do the easy play here. Do the easy play. Don't try to go hero ball. So uh, he was great last night. You know, he gave him enough points in the third and fourth to kind of, he looked pissed off when they blew that lead. He did kind of like, okay, I this is ridiculous. We got to close this out. And he did, to his credit. But that second quarter was what Finch wants. That third quarter was basically the antithesis of what Finch wants. I think, um, so starts of games have been bad going back, <laughs> you know, what, two, three weeks now, right? Um, I was just like before the game, the Lakers game, just going through and like ripping through like amp pick and roll possessions, right? Yeah. Um, because it really stood out to me in, in the Phoenix game, you know, we're, we're used to ant getting quote unquote double their blitzed mm -hmm, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And what I liked what Phoenix did was they kind of like put two on the ball and then like held it. Mm. It's kind of like held it. And they made like a, a two person wall into like, if it's, you know, if it's Beal on ant and bull bull comes up as the, the second guy, they're just kind of like holding it there. And then, all right, if, you know, if Ant decides to kind of reject the screen and go right, then Beal's going to take it, right? And and if he's going to go left, then then Bull's going to take it. But they kind of are waiting until Ant decides, right? Rather than what Ant got really good at, right, was they're blitzing me. They're putting two on the ball. I know what to do here. Let's just hit the guy in the pocket. Let's just get off of it. Let's move it. It's four on three. But with it being a some doubles and, like, less aggressive, it's not just, like, get off of it, right? It's like... Yeah get off of it in the right way that creates the, the right amount of space. And they say that to me, like, at the beginning of games, I think part of the reason it's been bad is, one, they don't know how they're going to cover Ant. Like, what is, what is the way in which they're going to be guarding him? And then Ant needs some time to process how that is. And I think teams are getting more creative, um, more effective, more random with the ways in which they're guarding Ant. Again, and it can't be. You can't fall down 15 nothing just because you it's taking you too long to to read you know read the coverages but i think that's some of what's behind that there um and ant you know needs to be quicker in in figuring some of that out but to his credit i think he does you know over has over the course of the game and last night did that uh, against the lakers easier i think easier defensive team particularly if once davis was out to be able to solve and be a playmaker in that sort of way. But uh, I think it's, you know, this is going to be, <clears throat> it's going to be a challenge for Ant. And I have a lot of belief in Ant's ability to dial it up for the playoffs. But what I would just note, which I've been saying a couple times for the past month or so, is the top of the scouting chart in a playoff series is Ant. Mm -hmm. And and they are going to throw everything, their smartest, best tactical things at him. And that has not been, that was not the case in the Memphis series. That was not always the case in, in the Denver series in the playoffs last year. Um, and the good news is Ant's two years older and has gotten better at processing some of these, these sort of things. But there might be a bad or a couple bad Ant games over the course of a playoff series because of the attention he gets and the, just the insistence I think the other teams are going to have in trying to, to take him away. And, you know, he's going to have to 
fight to play through that in the smartest way possible, getting off of it in the right way, empowering Nas Cat, whoever it might be, to you know to be able to to go there. But it's uh you know it, it's a factor. He's seeing different things and he's seeing more intention uh, from from the other teams, and it's you know sometimes leading to turnovers and sometimes leading to you know the attacking a switch and settling for a difficult mid range jumper. Um, he, he's processing here, but it's, it's, it's hard. It's, it's, it's hard for him right now. Can you expand on that a little bit? Cause that kind of opened my eyes. I thought it too, but I didn't really know how to describe it. You said like a delayed double, you know, like the way he gets doubled right now, isn't like the Caitlin Clark, just yeah, at, yeah, yeah. at half court immediately throw two guys at him thing. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's really smart what you just said. So I want to throw it back to you because it does seem now that was really smart where you said this is really dumb, but like if it's, if Ant goes outside and it's raining, he knows what to do. Right. Yeah. But if Ant goes outside and the forecast says it's going to rain, I don't know if he always knows what to pack mm -hmm. or like what to do. And in that Suns game, it really stood out that that was like the, Hey, it's going to eventually rain. And they would kind of like have the, the double set up in certain spots that if he dribbled into and mm -hmm. back to your point, when, when you become the face of the league, when you become the face of the franchise, you are listed now at the top of the scouting report. And it would be my biggest concern of, and I think this is just now we pivot into the Phoenix Suns game moving forward. But I think I think there was a little bit of like, yo, I'm playing against Kevin Durant tonight, and that's my guy. I think he looked a little more. I mean, he was screaming into the TV because he was getting fouled a lot. But there was more A's in that game than I think in the previous two weeks combined. And also just he has to. And you said he's two years older, right, than his first playoff appearance. Facts. He's also still 22. And I'm a little concerned, you know what I mean? Like, this is all going to eventually go as far as Ant can take him. But if I ever said in a playoff game the next morning, hey, Ant had eight assists last night and one turnover, we'd be, you'd be like, oh, so we're doing a game recap that they won, right? right? But then yeah. you go look at some of his box scores and some of their recent losses, and it's like five assists, six turnovers. So if you were trying to pick a stat or a combo that's going to give you a, the best idea of if this team can win a playoff series or make a deep run, to me, it's like assist to turnover ratio because they are going to double them and, and they're going to do it in so many creative ways. And he still hasn't even seen all the different coverages. I think a lot of teams, I thought this in the Suns game, but I think a lot of teams are probably still holding their best cards. They don't want to show those until the playoffs start. I always think of like Ty Lue is going to, the Wolves played the Clippers. He's going to throw some shit at Ant that he's never seen before. So how quickly can a guy that is, yes, multiple playoff series under his belt, but how quickly can a 22-year-old all-star pick up that and learn that and how much of a role again does like slow-mo and and mike and finch and mike and nori play in helping expedite because he's going to have to learn on the fly he is mm -hmm. going to see things two weeks from now that he's never seen before in the league and if he can figure out you know the 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 answers quick yeah, how what's fine. the timing of that but if it's right. you know if it's a rookie quarterback thing it's like oh, i still gotta go through my pro then they're then they're screwed so the sun's game i mean they, they defended him really well i I think there's some overreactions to that, but I'll throw it back to you. But yeah, the, the delayed double is a cool way for me to start looking at these games because that seems way more difficult for him to figure out than just walking outside and it's raining. Particularly when it's length, right? Is that you know, like, yeah, like, yeah. like like the bowl one stood out sometimes, you know, it's, it's, it's KD. I even think, you know, and whatever, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about the, that, that Suns game some, but they're, they're long. That's a, that's a big long mm -hmm. team that when they're dialed defensively is good. And they, they were good in that. Um, I guess this is last night and the, the Phoenix game. I do think it is worth noting as we're, we're praising ant um, that he did not have a good defensive weekend at all. Um, I mean, pretty disappointing. And I, I think it's pretty easy to distill down. He he was given in the Suns game the Kevin Durant matchup, right? You know, we we're kind of how how are they going to match this all up? Uh, they opt to put Ant on KD, and then in the Lakers game they opt to put um, Ant on D'Lo to to start the game. But by the end of the first quarter, they changed that in both of the games because Ant couldn't do it, um, and. In in the Suns game, a lot of it was they're running KD off of pin downs, and we know Ant with off ball screens navigating them. He struggles, isn't good at it, doesn't fight through those. Um, and it was like, okay, switching, putting Kyle on on Kevin Durant, and I get that because I I know that's something Ant's still learning. 
I haven't seen him be good at screen navigation. The the Dilo one really frustrated me in the first quarter of, of last night's game <clears throat> because that's the guy. That's who they're running their offense. So there's no LeBron in that game. Yeah. Ant Ant has that job. And I tweeted this out, uh, the clip of, of two of them in the first quarter. It's a Nas makes a three, a three. Like everyone, you get back. Like you make a three, everyone's back. Like you can get back and play defense. There's there's no excuse there. And the Wolves transition back into defense and Ant moves back to the, the right corner and picks up Rui Hachimura, who's Nas Reed's guy. Because Hachimura is the power forward and Nas is guarding Hachimura. Um, which means, because Ant decides to go guard Rui, that Nas is on D'Lo. D'Lo cooks that floater. Two possessions later, Ant makes a, a mid-range shot. Ball kind of, again, bounces around the rim, falls through. By the time the ball goes through the net, the Wolves are all back beyond the, the three-point line, transitioning back in defense. Again, Ant goes and guards Rui Hachimura, not his guy. Cross matches happen, like, not in those situations. But in transition, and, or like in, yeah, in right, sped up right. moments, not in just in, moments in, like in that, yeah. chaos. Tran mm -hmm. Cross yeah. matches happen in chaos, and that's okay. And you got to survive them, and Nas has to... In those situations, like, hey, we're here, we're in a scramble. You got to guard D'Lo here, like, square him off, make him get up, get it off the ball, right? That did not need to happen. And then on that possession, again, Ant is guarding Rui Hachimura in the corner. Here we go. Nas is guarding uh, D'Lo in isolation again. D'Lo gets to the middle floor, kicks to Austin Reeves, uh, open three, because whoever was guarding Reeves, maybe McDaniels, uh, had to come in to help on D'Lo. It's open right there. This is a great defensive team. But we've talked about this throughout the season. There is a laziness to their cross matches in, mm -hmm. in transitions. Not always just Ant. We've seen uh, Kat and Rudy struggle with that sometimes. Like, hey, we're both centers. Like, I'll, I'll guard the five this time. You guard the four. Like, we're just going to, you know, and it's when they're unnecessary cross matches, it's going to hurt this team. And it seems like in the weeds, nitpicky, whatever. But like in the playoffs, this stuff is, is going to matter. I don't think Ant can be the guy where you say go guard Kevin Durant, go guard the, the best player as the primary matchup for the game. Ant's best thing is to be like a relief pitcher, a closer, mm -hmm. right? And be like, okay, here we go. These couple possessions after a timeout, guard this guy here, pick him up there. Um, but but I don't think we're at a point where he can be relied upon to be somebody who really impacts over the course of 48 minutes. A, a primary score. The good news is it doesn't have to be. You got Jane yep. McDaniels, Nikhil Alexander Walker, uh, Kyle Anderson, uh, Gar like Mike Conley. There's other guys that can, that can do that. And, and you know what? A lot of guys who are scoring 30 a game on one side of the ball are not guarding Kevin Durant on the other side of the ball, you know? So, so there's some of that there. I just, that really stood out to me over the course of the weekend. Um, yeah. Ant's ability to take on the main guy. And, to your relief pitcher analogy, if he's going to come in in relief, because we've, we've heard about this in times dating back to just a couple of weeks ago where post game, we hear that Ant in a huddle or during a timeout walked over to Jaden or walked over to Nikhil and was like, hey, I'm going to guard them now. That's cool, right? Sure. But Ant can't come in relief during a plate appearance, right? So if Ant during transition, during that chaos is like, no, 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 I'm going to take KD. I'm going to take LeBron. I'm going to take Booker. He need. I mean, what is the number one component of good defense it's communication mm -hmm. so if he's going to just like blow up the scheme or like i'm going to come in relief and i'm going to take this guy for three possessions he needs to like let everyone else on the team know and i think that you can see those breakdowns happen where whether it be a made basket or not i think some of the highlights you're just talking about now happened where he just went to a guy but there was no communication of like okay i'm gonna take Rui now you know Nikhil, you have to go get austin reeves so, and you see those breakdowns still yeah, happen with Ant. Yeah. yeah, you see that happen with Ant Rudy. I also think sometimes last night specifically, there's a couple, or the Rockets game really stood out where Kyle and Rudy or Kyle and a couple guys have communication breakdowns. Again, this is a really good defense. I don't remember in my mind a time when, I mean, this has been the best defense for, for sure. 94% of the season. That's so rare. You don't really see a team do that all season long, but come playoff time, when this all every possession matters a little more, 
your communication can't be like a 90%. It's got to be as close mm -hmm. to 100 as possible because those little breakdowns make it easier for a team to score. And it all circles back to me of then for a team that's not very good closing out games or in late game execution, if your best late game execution for the Wolves in the playoffs is just going to be getting stops, <laughs> it's not mm -hmm. going to be getting buckets. Mm -hmm. So you want to have that, you know, Fort Knox locked down as much as possible. And a lot of that comes back to Ant because if he's, you know, the hole in a five man defense, they're going to find that and they're going to go at it time and time again. Kyle, let's uh, let's move over to the the Suns matchup specifically. You know what what we what we learned in in that game. I I, I put down my notes like things that happened that game, and I drew a line through them. Like what were things that we actually learned about that will matter, like for a play from a playoff series standpoint. The way you know the the ways in which they're whatever the guard. We'll, we'll we'll talk about them. Then there was just some that were like happened in that game that maybe were a little bit more randomness, right? Maybe Nas playing terrible, bad luck variants, some of, some of that sort of stuff. Uh, so I want, I want to rattle through some of those things because I think that game does matter. Um, it was, we've been talking for months now about like, Oh, matchups in the West and, you know, maybe being too focused on what we've seen in some regular season matchups, you know, I think that the Kings and, the Pelicans and some of those things we've done huge segments throughout the, the past couple months on t the wolves in a specific matchup. We haven't known about the, the Suns and in this matchup because they haven't played them. They hadn't played them since November 15th, which I will remind people was that game happened 23 hours after the in-season tournament game um, in golden state, the Rudy headlock or the Draymond headlock of Rudy game they get to Phoenix on November 15th, play that game, get smoked. Um, and we were just kind of like, eh, you know, we didn't learn that much of it. It was a, it was a six game road trip, something like that, back to back, whatever. We kind of put that to the side and we've had to wait um, months to, to see those two, these two teams play again and not really knowing a lot about the matchup or having a lot of film uh, to, to go off of in that game. So I got a handful of things, but I did a uh, clip, uh, Finch after the game on on the matchup and and them losing the two games. We'll start with that. Here's Finch. Second time these guys have won decisively. Yeah. Not many teams can really say that. Yeah. Against you guys this season, is there anything that you, if you see them down the line, that you might have to guard against, with psychologically, with, with coming? I mean, in I don't, I don't, you know, they, yeah, they they've beaten us handily all uh, twice. All credit to them. The first time, <laughs> you know, our defense was awful. Uh, and tonight was our offense was awful. So we got we got to put two halves, to, uh, two sides of the ball together. And um, you know, I thought defensively we guarded them really well. You know, for the most part. You know, we had some breakdowns, of course, but those breakdowns were, you know, um, made worse by the fact we couldn't score. So, Kyle, it was the the first time the Wolves played the Suns. Uh, they had their worst defensive game of the season. Uh, the Suns scored 1.5 points per possession in that game. It was far and away the worst game of the season. The next worst game was uh, that game they lost. The next worst defensive game was when they lost to the Thunder by 23, and that was a defensive rating of 132.2. So it was way worse. That was, the, that was their worst defensive game of the season by far the first time uh, they, they played the Suns. And then last night, to Finch's point, uh, the offense was was awful. They had an offensive rating of 76.9 or 0.769 points uh, per possession. And their next worst offensive game of the season was that brutal opener loss to the Toronto Raptors. Remember that? The And that was an uh, offensive rating for the Wolves of 93-1. So they have, with separation, had their worst defensive game of the season against the Suns and then separately had their worst offensive game Um of, of the season against the the Suns. How much do you take up from that? How much, what, what did you learn about that? Let, let, let's actually start there. Let's not brush any of it off. What, what did the Suns do or what have the Suns done uh, that we learned in those matchups that we do think matters right now? I think you and I see this Suns thing, whether it be Friday's game or the two games, just differently. Like, okay. I don't know. I, I will. And I want to get into a little highs and lows impromptu here in a sec, but, uh, I, the Suns are a tough matchup 
and they, you know, they have some real strengths. Again, to your point, I thought it was interesting. The Wolves did actually play really good defense. They just couldn't score, and that's a problem, and that's kind of been their Achilles heel. The offense, even when the offense is good, it's not that good. Um, and Phoenix does have a lot of length. Like it was, they didn't have Beal. I don't, I literally don't even want to talk about the November game. I think that is such an why, what would you take from that? I, that was the closest thing the Wolves had to just giving up a game. Wouldn't have it to play devil's advocate. Wouldn't that stance make more sense if they didn't look terrible against them again? No, 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 no. I'm just saying like that first game to me is like, I don't even want to say, well, you know, the Suns have beat them twice. That first one whatever like and they haven't played the suns at home yet and it's going to be funny now too because they're going to play the suns at the last game of the season and who knows sure. who's going to plan that but on friday they got punked like let's i'm not trying to overshadow that they got punked it was also i've never seen a team be down 15 to nothing thank god that wasn't at target center people would have had just sore legs from standing up uh but there were so many missed layups i thought too and I don't know if that's part of the length thing that Phoenix can throw at you. I thought they did a really good job of staying connected, if that makes sense. And even, I mean, you say KD, you say Bull Bull, but like even Grayson Allen's long. Um, obviously, Devin Booker has now become, you know, kind of the prototypical two-way. I mean, he can defend really well. Beal gives you some some moments. Um, I think the Sun set a lot of illegal screens, by the way. That's just another note I had, but... uh. Yeah, I mean, a lot of that stuff, too, they're not deep. That, that, that's, like, my biggest takeaway from this. I don't – you can tell me what you saw on Friday. I just thought it was a little – they came out flat, and after that it was just kind of swimming uphill on a team. The Suns really, like, run the football. Like, they really slow down the clock, get into their sets, use up a lot of shot clock and stuff because their Achilles heel is fourth quarter stuff. And if the Wolves could have just ever gotten it to 10 – I mean, clearly they did with the bench brigade at the end when it was all garbage time, but – if the Wolves could have just gotten it closer and put the pressure back on Phoenix, I think it, I think they could have won that game despite being down 15 nothing. Um, but yeah, the size, the length, but they have no depth. And come playoff time, I don't think these teams are going to play in the first round. But if they do, uh, once Nurkic is off the floor, I mean, I think Nurkic actually is. That trade was awesome for them, like the Aiton thing, because he just he sets awesome picks. He kind of like is the high post point guard for them in certain spots and then he gets all the rebounds like Nurkic will have 80 percent of their rebounds almost every game it seems like so if they can kind of go at him a little more maybe get him off the court and make the Suns play a little smaller or like literally like figuratively less weight I think that would be good for them too but I don't I don't know I, I thought the, the Wolves got absolutely doors blown off but I didn't come away from that being like okay it's all over and no no I no think I, that's, I, I, I didn't I either. think that was a little bit of the energy and I was a little disappointed. It's like, okay, yes, they did not look good against the Suns team tonight. And the November game is what it is, but I don't know. Did, did Finch, you and I were going out this on Friday. Did Finch show all his cards? Like, did they want to even make certain adjustments in this? Or were they just like, we're going to keep trying to do the same thing. Like against the Suns, man, I don't think you can play J Mac and Kyle Anderson. Mm -hmm. Like that's a little tweak. Like, I don't think you can, even though J Mac's been shooting the leather off the ball, you got to just have more guys that are real offensive threats because I think maybe you clipped this, but there was one possession where Kyle's in the corner and Eric Gordon and the ball's on yeah. the other. Like Eric Gordon is so far in the paint that if Kyle is Carl, Eric Gordon can't do that. And then everything on that defensive rotation ch changes and then Ant can get to the basket. So I'm, I'm not concerned about it. It might be the worst team for them to play in the first round, but I'm not going to start doing this shit where it's like Suns in five. No, no, like, I, I, I'm not either. I'm, I'm, I'm just... We haven't seen the, the the two teams play, so I'm again, if in particular, if you're throwing out the November game, I'm just like, what do they have for the Wolves? Doesn't mean like, what do they have that will break the Wolves, but like, what what are things that they can present to to make it more difficult? Or what I think maybe a way that we do see this one differently is like, I leave that game on a positive note, zero percent scared of Yusuf Nurkic and being able to do anything in that. I thought. Like he finished with 11, 15, and six in that game, five of 11 shooting. But I went into that a little concerned. It might be a little Sabonisy, right? Where oh, yeah. Rudy's got to guard him one on one. Those kind of forceful fives are the ones that if Rudy gets hurt, it's often by them. Not worried about that in in this in a playoff series if, if and when these two teams uh, match up. I'd like to actually see Rudy ignore him more, get back to the rim. They'd like to play that, you know, delay, have Nurkic at the top of the key often kind of as a passer. He's a good, he's a good passer. I, I mean, I'm guarding Nurkic like 
Aaron Gordon. Like mm-hmm. I'm not getting out there. Keep Rudy, keep Rudy back. Um, at least to like his heels on the free throw line there. So he can recover back. There's in the first half, there's a bunch of like Booker, you know, slashing KD back cuts. Like I was like, where's Rudy? Oh, he's out like pressuring Nurkic on the perimeter. I don't need that. You know? Uh, so I, I just say that to mean like the Nurkic part of it, I think is an advantage um, in, in this series. And I kind of like him when they have drew Eubanks on the floor a little bit better because there isn't like, for them, like the insistence of giving him the ball, I think Eubanks is like a good rim protecting back in the vein of backup centers uh, is good there. I, I do kind of like their their depth. I think Royce O'Neal uh, is is if they're healthy, right? And Royce O'Neal is then coming off the bench of Grayson Allen um, is is starting there. I, I think that the thing that that concerned me most, which we kind of got to, that concern, but like impacted the Wolves the most is that shell defense was good um that that the that the Suns you know put on them it it was it wasn't just the straight switching five is a little bit more aggressive they're really in the passing lanes I think they played physical maybe you get more foul calls if you if you run that back but um I just I thought their their defense was impactful not just represented by the numbers of it being the Wolves worst offensive game but I don't go into that matchup being like the Wolves are going to be able to really punish the Suns' mediocre defense, if that makes sense. That's a couple things I have. Yeah, that's weird. I just don't agree. But I like, who am I? You, you're a senior, and I'm a freshman when it comes to basketball. Like, oh, I, 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 I think, I think Nurkic is. I think they're better with Nurkic on the floor. I mm-hmm. just think with his size. Again, we talked about screen navigation. He sets some of the hardest that's screens, fair. and they're also moving a lot. <laughs> but he's yeah. big, and also too, like he's not your prototypical rim protector Mm -hmm. but he also is going to hit you like he is one of the most physical guys in the league and when he plays against rudy gobert who gets hit a lot i think nurk just gets away with a lot of hits on rudy so i don't know if i'm going into this series being like oh actually you know i hope drew eubanks is on the floor you know shout out oregon state but i think he's really good out there i think he also does set the table for a lot of those guys just kind of looking at team stats too um from that game the Wolves were doubled up in free throws. It was They took 14. The Suns took 29. Um, but again, the rebounding thing, I don't think the Suns have a lot of good rebounders on the team because they are small. Sure. And they out-rebounded the Wolves in a game where they had Nas, they had Rudy. So I guess maybe if this ever becomes a thing and they do, I don't expect any sort of data again from when these teams play the last game of the season because you might see both bench brigades start depending on seating. Um, but yeah, I think the more dumbed down but real version of what would concern you the most about the Suns for me is that that's one of the few teams in my mind that they would go into a series and they would have two of the three best players Hmm. right like I mean I you you could probably say well what about the Clippers I don't think the Clippers have two of the three best players if they play the Wolves I think I agree with that yeah right I don't think maybe I mean it's close yeah and then now if not just we'll do this on the fly I don't think the Wolves if they play the Mavs the Mavs have two of the three best players they have Luka but I would take like Gobert's impact over what Kyrie does, yeah. and Kyrie's cooking. It's always it's always weird when it's Gobert, right? That we right, have to right. like do but, the but thing. The but the Suns I, won. I yeah. When the Suns won, it's KD and Booker. Like that's yeah. with a bullet. So that's like your biggest concern when these games do. I mean, ninety seven, eighty seven. That could be a lot of playoff scores come April. And the Suns known. I've talked about this before, like with Ant, Kevin Durant. Devin Booker and even Bradley Beal a little bit, they have spots on the floor. They have go-to moves in those certain situations and has never really developed that yet. So between the combination of, yeah, the Suns actually are sneaky long and have length at all positions, even when they bring guys off the bench. I mean, even like Royce O'Neal is long and, and a good guy that they've kind of been mixing in now since the trade deadline. So the Suns have probably given the Wolves the most trouble, but I'm not going to disparage a team that has you know, 54 mm. wins and think that no. they can't solve the riddle. And I'm just trying to, again, stress that was a reverberating sense that I got by checking the timeline that light is like, Oh, it's over if the wolves play the suns. And it's like, they haven't even played them at home yet. Like, come on. To be, to be clear what, what I'm, I'm just looking at this from like a, all right, if it was a playoff series, what, what, like, what do we even have? What are, what are the bullet points? that I can put down uh, about the series. And I don't think they're all negative things. I think the Nur- to, it, it's just my opinion. Apparently you disagree. Like the Nurkic one is a positive one. Not worried about Nurkic. 
uh, in that series. I, I just think, you know, we learned McDaniels can make it tough on Booker. We didn't know about that. Yeah, There's some yeah. mid-range guys. There's some guys that do hurt Jaden a little bit. I feel, you know, not that Booker's not going to have a good series if they play them, but like we feel confident that Jaden, you know, can can make it tough on him. I think we also learned they're going to put Ant on KD, or at least start with that. They're they're open to that. That's that's that would be that that was new information, right? We didn't we didn't know how they were going to, you know, approach that exactly. I think we also learned that the Wolves are willing to go small to counter that team. There was a lot of we were texting about this. There was a lot of Reed at the 5, McDaniel's at the 4. They played Reed McDaniel's and then it was like a combination of three wings. One time it was Reed McDaniel's Alexander Walker, Morris Conley, Reed McDaniels, Edwards, Morris, J Mac. They they played those lineups. Now, is it different if it's cat out there? Maybe not. Maybe it's just cat at the five, McDaniels at the four, and a willingness to go smaller at some times. We just saw a willingness to to go small, uh, to counter there. Uh, what else do I have? Can tough speak, one for Conley. Speaking but of like lineups, Austin. quick, because you, you were talking about lineups and we were texting throughout the game. Monty, Na, Ant, Jaden, Kyle at the five. I was like, Texas was like, I love that lineup. Would have been cooler if it went longer. And you're like, yeah, they did it for 30 seconds. But that 30 <laughs> seconds was like, oh shit. I don't think, uh, I don't remember a lot of times where they had Kyle at the five just because that's mm -hmm. really difficult to do when you, that means, yeah, when, you know, when whole health guys are healthy, yeah. Nas and Carl and Rudy. But uh, yeah. And again, I, I came away from that Suns game. Again, I don't want to over, or, you know, I think the Suns do present some real matchup issues. And they're really well coached, right? I mean, Frank Vogel is like a defensive guy. So he probably is going to look at a team that's bad offensively and be like, I can make you even worse defensive or offensively. But uh, I came away from that Suns game too, thinking like this would have been a nice Carl game just to have sure. him spacing the floor more because absolutely. I mean, whether Ant's legs are tired from what he's done since Carl went down or whatever apologies you want to make, he just didn't get to the rim much. And I don't know, again, if that's because he saw the rain coming or if he just didn't want to do it that game. But putting Kyle and or Carl in spots where Kyle was would have really just helped stretch the floor. I think that would, I think Carl matches up really well against the Suns. That's just kind of my two cents on that. Um, and I also think too, in, in a, the depth thing, like I don't think we should overshadow that or like if these two teams do play the Suns play like six and a half guys or seven guys, the Wolves can play 10 or, you know, 11. Yeah, I, I don't I, agree with that part. Why? Because I, they don't play six and a half or seven guys. I think they have a pretty solid bench. Like, just name them quick for me. Maybe, maybe, maybe again, it's been a long week. But like Eubanks, Royce O'Neal, I think they can situationally go bull bull. Um, if they want another perimeter defender, they can go Josh Akogi, who was the ninth guy that played in that game. Um, Royce O'Neal, Drew Eubanks, Eric Gordon. Eric Gordon. I think Gordon saw. I mean, like, I'm not like great. I just don't like. I don't know. I was thinking about, I watched the Kings yesterday. Like the Kings have a bench problem. I think the Suns have a bench. I, I don't know. And, and then, and then particularly just in the sense of looking at the play, and this isn't to take away from the Wolves. I'm like, the Wolves have a bench advantage in that game. They have a, they probably are going to have the best bench of anybody in the whole playoffs, right? Maybe them in Boston or something. Um, but I don't know. Like, I, I guess I struggle to even know how to quantify that in the sense of the playoffs when I'm pretty sure like Booker, KD and Beal are all going to play 38 and, and Allen are going to probably play 38, 40 minutes a night. Right. Like, um, I don't know, not to say that the Wolves bench couldn't be advantageous for them, but I don't know. I, I, I that, that's maybe, maybe I'm not thinking you're just, it. we're probably just looking at through different. Sure. Again, maybe it's just because I literally played against Drew Eubanks once and I'm just, I come playoff time. <laughs> if you're like, Hey, their bench is Drew Eubanks and bowl bowl. It's like, Okay, point for me. Right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no. I, and I mean, maybe I'm thinking like little things again. The defense was good. Maybe you can get out and transition more, just run them. You're right. Playoff mm -hmm. basketball is all about playing your best guys, but their best guys are just older too. Sure. So uh, if you can just make them work more, yeah, sure. Kevin Durant, 40 minutes, one of the best. But you know what? He's older and he has torn his Achilles mm -hmm. before. Like make him work then. Make him get out and transition and defend and go at him a little more. Because I don't think, I'll just stand by, I don't think they have a good bench. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think, you know, the guys they're bringing in, even like Eric Gordon, like they just don't have a lot of guys I'd be worried about offensively, especially Bobo and Eubanks, and then defensively too, like go at Eric Gordon. Get these guys in switches. They don't have a real point guard. Right? To go the cap point, that, 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 
is what would help. I think Cat can punish all of those guys, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and and that's a, that's whole. Bunch. So that's what I oh, actually I have just one last thing for something I learned or to, like to watch for in that they ran a ton of like double screens. You know, you think of that like double drag, you know, the two big Phoenix did. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Um, or if people want to look this up, the play at the very end of the second quarter it ends with a Kevin Durant uh, three in in the corner, and they kind of run like a confusing sequence of double screens uh, for Booker. Ant has to then r- slide over as the loam. Ant's guarding KD in the corner, right? Has to come over. Like Ant actually executed it well. Like you have to take away that short roll layup at the rim. And then it's like, boom, KD wide open in the corner. Um, I think again, and I think this is just a film one. Like you just, you just hammer that home, double drags, the Spain pick and rolls, that stuff just at the top with with shooters involved in the action and a, a ball handler that can come in even if the wolves defense doesn't have a breakdown can still come in and take that 17 foot you know mid-range pull-up shot like they're gonna what and of course everyone's got to do that like plan plan for that opponent i think they can well i don't think that was a bad defensive game i think the suns offer some unique offensive actions given the strength of their mid-range scores that like if you're the wolves you know, you got to adjust to acclimate to and to their credit, like they have, they did that against the Clippers, right? Like a similar team in that sort of way, kind of played them a couple of times. I think figured out the depth at which they want to play go bear um, in terms of guarding the mid range guys. Like I, it's not a, there, there's nothing I think in the playoffs that can break the wolves defense. But like that, you know, maybe that that pokes into a pressure point. You got something? Well, I was just going to say, so I'm the only one on earth, I think, that had to watch the NBA TV last night. But then they do Ant post game. And for a guy that has been pretty upfront that I don't know what the standings are. I think the guy interviewing <laughs> Ant said, you know, how big is this? How big is this win? Right. As we kind of come down the final stretch and I'll have to go. For, I recorded the video, but Ant kind of leaked that it's really big for us. And he, you could tell in the moment he was kind of catching himself. Like, I don't want to give too much bulletin board material, but it's like, we want to have that one seed because we want to have like the quote unquote easier path, which is like, he's saying this at Staples center Mm -hmm. when they might have to play the Lakers again, but he specifically referenced, he's like, you know, cause the Suns are six and he kind of like gave a little leak of, we probably don't want to play Phoenix in the first round. And it was about as close as he's ever gotten to being like, Ideally, we'd like to not play them. So maybe that is a real thing behind the scenes. Like maybe they are all organizationally. That team is probably the one that's going to give us the most fits. Mm-hmm. I just thought it got a little over the top of Suns in five sure. or whatever, where it's like, hey, man, like how about the Suns just have to come to Target Center for a game first, which they have not done all season. And how about they have to play the Wolves again? No Beal in the first one. Wolves coming off choke gate. But let's see the Suns have to guard a full version of the Timberwolves that have Carl back, but also, you know, I, I the Nas Reed thing to close the loop on the Suns game. I don't think the Suns did anything. I agree with Nas that. play poorly. Nas just played poorly. Mm-hmm. I'll bet on Nas Reed to play better in a seven game series against that team. Yeah. I haven't done a really good job of delineating this stuff, but I said like stuff I did learn from that matchup that matters and stuff that didn't that like, I don't think I'm going to p- apply and take into an analysis of a Wolves Suns matchup is the 15 0 start to start the game. Nas played <laughs> terribly, and I rewatched the game and I'm looking for it. And the only thing I've written down is they did a really good job of staying attached. They stayed on his hip um, and they got him at the rim a couple of times. But, like, again, I'm not betting on anything like that happening from Nas because, you know, to his credit, outside of maybe like a one for seven three point shooting game, he's just an extremely consistent player. And, and him having a bad game is an inconsistency. I, I think more than it is like a plot point. Also 18 turnovers um, in that game. Was that Phoenix? We're giving their defense some credit, mm-hmm. but like Phoenix isn't really a, a high turnover generation team. Um, like they're 25th in turnovers for us this season. So like, was that that game? I don't know. Maybe it was their defense. Like it's hard for me to give a, a lot of credit to that. And I think the other one we haven't mentioned from that game too, Gobert stunk four, six and one. But I rewatched that I, again, looking for what did they do? And I don't know. I, it just, again, they stayed attached to him on the roll. But I, I think Gobert had such a bad game in that game because Ant, Nas, and Conley played poorly. 
he can't get his own stuff going. Those guys need to get offense going to open up things for him on the lob, on the roll, on the duck in. Um, and so I, I didn't have, I didn't take, I'm acknowledging Nas had a bad game. I'm acknowledging they turned the ball over too much. I'm acknowledging Gobert didn't play well, but I don't take that to be in a meaningful way uh, a Phoenix specific thing. And if you haven't watched the Suns, like if you're just a a Wolves fan who doesn't catch some of the other games, one thing this, this is a real thing, right? Like the Wolves, maybe Achilles heel, little lack of maturity and then late game execution. No team right now has a worse like net rating in the fourth quarter than the Suns. Like it is historically bad. Sure. And in these first two games, because the first one I've thrown out and the second one, it was like a 20 point game almost to the end. You haven't seen the Wolves, who are the best defensive team in the league, square up against a team that is literally blowing fourth quarter leads one game after another. And that would be an interesting dynamic of once these teams actually play in a playoff series. So the Suns are good. They're kind of finding their stride. But all in all, again, you got to the Wolves clinch the top three seed. They're going to have more games at home than their opponent in this first round. I want to see, I just need more. I need more before I'm going to overreact to that. You meant, let, let's do like five or 10 minutes on the, the cat returning thing. But before we close, you mentioned that from Ant's interview, he did the little eye emoji thing and was like, cat's coming back. Um, so let's talk about that quickly. I, I just wanted to mention, we do have that pair of tickets to mm. give away to Tuesday's uh, game against the Wizards uh, for Patreon subscribers. If you're a Patreon subscriber, just send us um, a DM uh, on there that you are available for for Tuesday's game against the Wizards. I'll you know pick out what we'll randomly choose who who that person is that gets those tickets on uh, Tuesday morning. So I'll be looking for that message back from me uh, on on Patreon for that Wizards game. That's patreon.com slash Jane Moore MBA. Um, if you're already a subscriber, send us a message there. Or if you want to become one, um, you can do it there. That's in in the show notes uh, as well. Uh, Kyle, I'll give you the floor for. Cat might be returning. I, me and Britt did way too long on cat reintegration, which I was on team cat, I think, which was, uh, well, the best part about that pod is that it was five hours long. So I listened to it on the way back from Honolulu, uh, cause I didn't have Wi Fi. So thanks for that. And, uh, it's a really good pod. So go listen to that because it was two really smart people completely disagreeing on, on a topic, right? I think you would admit that you both saw it a little differently. But the one thing you didn't add in there, I didn't think that. When, when you integrate these all-star players back in, right? Like this isn't the first time a team has been bringing in one of their best players in game 80 or 81. And last night, Ant does look in the camera eye emoji and say, Cat's coming back. This morning, Shams is like, he, Carl participated in a scrimmage yesterday. Like he's getting close. Um, but typically when you integrate these stars back in, Dane, you have to worry about the politics of it, right? And you said something that I thought was really smart to Britt was, you, you have a window here. Like, this is a real thing. This is, I, I know we go old wolves. Old, this is, this team has a real chance to win a title or make a run in, in the finals. And I don't really worry about the politics of this one because most of the time you fold these guys back in. You're like, well, I don't want to piss them off. I don't want to bring them off the bench. I don't want to shorten their minutes because if they get pissed off, they're going to demand a trade in the summer. Well, they might have to trade Carl anyway this summer, <laughs> right? So like, there is no worry about the politics of, Finch should feel empowered to do whatever he's got to do to make this the greatest chance to try to win these games. And not and I, specific to Carl, too. Same applies to, same Aunt, applies Rudy, to everyone. Yeah. Like, whatever. Yep. I, I think it's weird. Not, to, I don't want to get out and start talking summer stuff. Like, you have all these guys signed, most like, right? Your top seven players are signed. You might have to move the guy coming back anyway. So if he doesn't integrate or he doesn't, you know, the quote unquote LeBron, Kevin Love, if he tries to fit out too much instead of fitting in, you might have to get rid of him anyway. So I'm not worried about that. I really think, and the Suns game highlighted it, even last night a little bit highlighted it, you can't, and you said this to Britt, you can't finish this special season the way you want without Carl. And that's all, that's all, like my only take is you need his shooting. He does need to come back and be like, okay, I see how Nas plays. I need to be quicker with the ball. I need to be comfortable spacing in the corner on a dozen possessions where I'm just literally, you know, Ryan Anderson in the corner. But it's like, yeah, but you're the best shooting three point shirt of all time like that would be great so i'm not really worried about the integration i'm really excited that he might get a couple regular season games to just a get in basketball shape but also to see if he can we talk about leadership stuff all the time like flagrant howls and i think one of the things i like about carl as a leader is that he has over and over again shown in my mind an ability to just like let others get some of the you know take the lead or whatever people were concerned 
earlier this season about is Carl going to be comfortable passing the baton to Ant? Well, that's happened, and they've had the second best season in franchise history. So I'm just probably saying a lot of the stuff that you said to Britt, but I think this is the easiest example of integrating an all star back into something that's humming because Finch can point at it worked when we played this way. And if I piss you off, then we're probably going to make second apron transactions later this summer anyway. So they need what Carl does best. And if Carl has straight voltage, then you just put him on the bench and you bring in nuts. The, to me, the best news is if Carl does what is fairly straightforward or become fairly straightforward of how this team needs to play, if he does those things, what they've been doing over the past month, it's going to work. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. it's going to work. I, yeah. I would be very surprised if it did it. Um, the question, of course, is whether or not Carl will do it. Bingo. And 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 a lot, and then and that's tough because you're particularly once you get into a playoff setting or whatever, like it's you're acting more reactionary, right? Um, Ant's gonna probably uh, at some times in the playoffs fall into bad habits of forcing it through double teams or triple teams and in, in a crowd and not getting off of it, like we just talked about before. That's that's gonna happen, and Carl's gonna do that some too. It's is that going to be uh, what is it? A, a feature or a bug, right? You know, um, yeah. like, and, and, and that's, that's ultimately the question. And I think there is a ton of skepticism out there about whether or not Carl will do it. will be able to do it. And I get it. A lot of people are going off of having watched Carl play the same way a lot, not play the same position. He's, and, and that's a counter argument of people of like, look, we've seen Carl adjust to playing a new position to embracing this role, to doing this and that. And, and I, and I agree. And we've praised that up and down this season. This feels like a little bit of a different thing that is, is harder to know that Carl will accommodate and do, because even while he's adjusted his position, there's still been, the ball getting sticky with him, mm -hmm. uh, a resistance to space, um, a mental focus element. Like to me, it's a little bit different than just embracing playing power forward. If that makes sense. But for the assumption to be that 99% chance he won't do it, that that's too far. Like mm -hmm. that's just too far. And that's the mop. But like, it's the same thing when Britt was like, you know, bring back, you know, have him run a high pick yeah. and roll with Leonard Miller. Yeah. Like it, it's, I don't know. Do I even think it's 50 50? I, I, don't, I don't know. I it's, just it's don't think a it's a 1% chance that he does it. I, I don't. But if he does it like this, the only way this team, like I said to Britt, the only way this team is going to the NBA finals is if this cat reintegration effectively works. And, you know, we're throwing out things like, oh, space into the corner and doing this and doing that. Whatever Finch decides the cat reintegration needs to be. However, he deems that to be because he's way smarter than all of us and what we think and how it might look. Will Cat do it? Will and, Cat yeah. do it the majority of the time? Um, because if he does, and if we trust Finch to make the right to draw up the right path, and Cat does it, then this is gonna work. And, like and, and I did such a good job, or such such a good job. <laughs> I did such a bad job of delivering this final take. But uh my thing is, like you said, it, it's the question is, will Cat do it? And my answer is, if he doesn't do it, it's really easy to just go in a different direction. Yeah. And you don't have to worry like other teams have in the past about, you know, upsetting someone because the summer could be chaotic anyway. So, yeah, is he going to do it? Is he going to embrace it? I also don't think in his defense he's ever returned or been integrated back. Like when he came back from his injury last year compared to this year, he's never come back to a team like this where it's like, hey, you just got to come back and be like the third best player. You don't have to carry the load. You know, you can think about sacrifice and all that stuff, but it the the hierarchy now is clear. The way this team wants to play is clear. And when Carl came back from the calf thing a year ago, it was like a mess. Please, Carl, come back. We need you. Mm -hmm. That's not what this is. Please, Carl, come back. We need you, but not in a desperation way. In more of, I mean, we've done this back and forth. I think it's inversed again, Dane. Carl is now kind of the ceiling again, and yeah. Ant is the floor. I know we've right. gone back and forth, but they need him to make a long run. But short term, if it if he hasn't bought in or he's not fully healthy or he can't move on the perimeter as well as he was doing this year, playing really good defense, then you just pull the plug 
and you go immediately to another alternative that you have that you didn't have last year, right? You mm -hmm. didn't have Nas Reed to throw against the Nuggets. You didn't have Jaden. So that was my thing. I do have one other just random, let's close it out with a high and low, but I'll throw it back to you if you have any Carl thoughts. No, 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 no. I, I got, go listen to 45 minutes of Carl thoughts will be a bread if you want to. <laughs> For, yeah, the that's the first segment is 45 minutes. Uh, <laughs> no, I just, I was kind of disappointed. I I tuned in Friday night too with pizza and wine. I was like, I haven't watched basketball in a while. And then the Wolves just gave us stinker and the Suns pounded them. And the vibes I thought for the first time from like a fan perspective were really bad. So a lot of overreactions about like how the Suns would be favored and the Pelicans would be favored and stuff. It was kind of disappointing. Whatever. One bad night. There was a moment I watched all the games yesterday again, because I missed them in that Rockets game. Is, I'm going to get like emotional talking about this that I have never seen from this fan base before. So I asked you to rewatch this 101 97. The Wolves are had got a big lead against the Rockets. They're at home at Target Center. It's late. And then the Rockets come firing back and the Wolves are doing their thing where they're taking bad shots and stuff. So it's 101 97. Dane's got up on the screen here and uh, they get a good look here for Ant and he misses it. And the Rockets come down and Fred Van Vliet buries a three and it's 101 100. And you're thinking, here we go again. And we don't have the sound on this, but if you go back and look at this at the 220 mark, Ant misses. It went into a standing ovation. Like all of the fans, as soon as Fred Van Vliet hits that three and it's a one point game, like yeah. Jordan dies leading the charge, but everyone stands up and is like cheering them on. And it wasn't, as I, I remember that at it, the game, it wasn't like tight butthole syndrome. Wolves fans were like, okay, we're not, fuck the Joe Smith thing. Forget about the Steph Curry stuff. Like, forget about all the ghosts of the past. None of those guys on the court give a damn about that stuff. And you can see it on the screen. Like, everyone's standing up and kind of giving them positive energy. And I know that sounds so stupid to so many people, but I think that shit really matters. Mike goes on, hits a floater. They come down, get a stomp, stop, next position, and has the dunk game over. Well, you and I don't have many pods left before the playoffs start. That's big. That's big to me. Like, I think you got to buy into this team. And I think this team has fought their asses off to have home court advantage. They haven't had that in what? I mean, did they have it the Jimmy year? No, right? The Houston Rockets did. So they haven't had home court advantage in 20 years. People listening to this pod are going to play a role in this playoff run. You know what I mean? Like Target Center has been a really tough place to play. You've heard opponents say that. You've heard opposing coaches say that. Like it sucks coming here. Uh, I want that type of energy when this thing kicks off in two weeks. You know, I was, I was watching Rounders in Hawaii last week with my dad. But, uh, there's this quote in there where it's like, I told Worm you can't lose, but you don't put in the middle, but you can't win much either. Like, buy into this. This is so fucking fun. Buy into this. Yes, the Suns game was an outlier, and maybe it's a bad matchup. Maybe they don't play them, but don't go into this thinking, oh, my God, you know. Because the, the idea I came away with Friday night was that the Wolves will be fine in the playoffs as long as they don't play the Thunder, the Nuggets, the Clippers, the Mavs, the Kings, the Lakers, the Suns, or the Warriors. As long as they can avoid that in the first round, the Wolves will be fine. Like, cut that shit out. You know, embrace this. We're all going to die one day. Like, embrace this. This is the best team ever. Or the best team in 20 years that this franchise has had. Bring that energy from the Rockets game, because I thought that was a really cool moment that just came through the screen of, like, we're blowing another lead, but instead of all sitting down and on our hands, like, they all stood up, went on a little run, and that was over. So, shout out to the, again, you're, you're there for, what, 41 games a year? I think Target Center, I'm jealous that I haven't been there this year. I'm excited to get back for playoffs. It looks like the fans are, they're going to have a role in this. I really believe in that. Yeah, it's letting go of the defeatist sort of mentality, yeah. which is completely normal and understandable to have, you know, sunk in over over 20 years. But um, I will say that's, that, that's not... Um, that was not unique to, to the Houston game. Like, they, you know... Right, yeah, that's right, what I you know, out, yeah. Right, like that they that the the norm is not to expect the worst it, it it hasn't been at at target center i think that's app that you picked that up on tv from afar too because i remember like i remember you know mike dribbling it up the floor really slowly got mike brings the ball to the floor so slowly and and He's been flying a lot though and then but it was like kind of the like the crowd just starts like coming up as as he gets it. i yeah it it, it stood out cool moment in the moment and yeah. i think you said it it epitomizes just it's been a cool season mm -hmm. and again that sun's loss notwithstanding this team is going to play more home games than road games in round one and having a tough place to play loud especially when you're a defensive team right like 
making it really uncomfortable on the court and around the court for your opponent is going to be big. So it just kind of that Rockets moment got me really excited yeah. for, you know, we're less than two weeks out from this team tipping it off, having a week off to rest while other teams that they're probably going to play in a one eight in a two seven are going to be, you know, running maybe on some fumes and adrenaline. So it's been a really fun season and it kind of was hammered home again this week when I was, you know, everyone's dealing with some stuff that's not basketball. It's like this, this team, this season has really, I think helped me a lot. And I think it's helped a lot of people get through whatever they're going through. So, uh, don't focus too much on the Suns game. We'll we'll figure it out. We'll figure out if Nurkic is good or not. Just like we figured out if Rudy was healthy or just didn't trust his teammates. Uh, <laughs> and but get excited. Buy those tickets. Get ready. We're going to be doing live events and content. We're going to be doing a lot of stuff come playoff time. Um, and let's you know, it's been a special season. Let's try to close it out in a special way. Awesome way to end up, man. Uh, that was that was really good. Uh, he's Kyle Tiggy. You can follow him uh, on Twitter at Kyle Tiggy. You can listen to him uh, over at Flagrant Howls. If you don't like Dane and Britt's negativity, <laughs> just pause it. Just go over to Flagrant House. That's that's cool. <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. Positivity. I've been described. No, no, no. That's it's good. I I'm proud of the array of guests we have uh, or contributors uh, on on this show, and I think that was awesome. The the way you just closed that. Appreciate you doing it, man. Um, I will be back with Chris Hine on Tuesday morning. Uh, he was in Phoenix and LA over mm. the weekend. Uh, I was not, uh, it was my first time not going to a road game in a while. I was like, oh, this, this is kind of nice. Nine o'clock, just come to the office and uh, watch it. But I, um, I, I missed the vibe of what was around yeah. the team. And I'm, uh, there wasn't like a lot of like the YouTube in the locker room. There's only like one video of Mike. Um, so I'm excited to, to talk to Chris. I recorded my TV last night. That's a little video. Yeah. <laughs> right, that was good. Hey, that was good. Right here. <laughs> um, so that's coming up on uh, on on Tuesday morning. Uh, me and Chris. Until then, uh, he's Kyle. I'm Dane. Peace out. How I'm feeling, man. I hope it never stop. Yeah, green and hot, so you can find me in the crowd. Yeah, yeah. Don't let standards ever ever bring you down. Yeah.